Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 70 of Patterson in Pursuit. I've got an extremely fun interview breakdown for you today with my conversation with Dr. Michelle Bulos Walker. We had a conversation about feminist philosophy. And for the first 15 minutes or so, I think we were roughly on the same page. And then as the interview went on longer and longer, I felt like the wheels started getting a little bit shaky. And then by the end, well, I won't spoil it for you, but suffice to say, we very strongly disagree. I spoke with Dr. Walker several months ago when I was in Australia. She teaches at the University of Queensland. Before we dive into it, let me tell you about the meditation app, 10% Happier, Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. They've been sponsoring the show for the past several weeks, and I've gotten some very good feedback from you guys who are taking advantage of the one-month free trial that you can get by going to steve-patterson.com slash meditate. The host of the app is Dan Harris, who's the author of the New York Times bestseller, 10% Happier, and he goes around interviewing professional meditators about the basics of meditation and then starts from the basics, works into more advanced concepts. If you like the style of this show where I'm going around talking to people about the basics and then working into advanced concepts, chances are you're going to like this app. But don't take my word for it. Stay skeptical and investigate meditation for yourself at steve-patterson.com slash meditate. All right, I hope you guys enjoy my interview breakdown of episode number 51, my conversation about feminist philosophy with Dr. Michelle Bulos Walker. All right, so the beginning of our interview talked about just definitions for what is feminist philosophy. And she brought up the point kind of right off the bat that by just being a woman doing philosophy is going to affect how society perceives the work that you're doing. And I think there's some measure of truth to this, probably more so in past centuries. But I think at present, women do face some kind of double standard in their work. Only reason I say this is because I know in talking to my wife, when she's had professional jobs, she is treated differently. She's kind of poo-pooed, patted on the head, not taken as seriously as if she were a man. This seems especially true in the medical world. If you go to a doctor's office and you're a woman, it seems like they practically assume that something's wrong with your mind and your head and you've got some psychological problems rather than biological problems. So I have seen this. However, my suspicion is also that it gets blown way out of context. If you're serious about talking philosophy, I think the majority of people are just going to be trying to treat your ideas seriously and not obsess over the fact that you have a different set of genitals than they do. But this interview, I felt like the first section, we at least had some common ground. To the extent that there are insecure people out there who are not comfortable treating a woman's ideas as they would a man's ideas, that's a problem. The feminist element helps us ask questions about what is going on when it, be, when it is or why it is an issue mm. that being a woman and doing philosophy is a big deal. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be a big deal. So when you say it's a big deal, does, are you saying, is this an institutional criticism from about um, the philosophy profession, or are you saying this is a more, an even broader critique of society in general? It's both. both. <laughs> <laughs> as, you, as you'd imagine, it's both, because at the institutional level, we know statistically that there are definitely fewer of us, of women doing, um, being paid, let's say, as professional philosophers, uh, but that fits within a social context that um, assumes that the philosopher is al already a, a male or a male body or a masculine body and is confused when confronted with mm. the, this notion of um, a woman occupying this very privileged position. So this is where we start to disagree a little bit. It comes up a lot more later in the discussion, but it's about economics. So used as evidence of the problem of discrimination in the philosophy profession is the fact that there are fewer female philosophy professors than there are male philosophy professors. I don't think the most likely explanation here is because of the patriarchy or because of discrimination against women. I think it's a kind of natural consequence of men and women being different. Men and women throughout their lives make different choices. They think a little bit differently. And so we would expect to see discrepancies in their chosen career paths. But more on that later. So on the one hand, 
Yes, it's true that women have been somewhat marginalised, often downrightly excluded. Like the 18th century particularly, we'd talk a, about a period of time where women are, are physically barred mm. from the practice of philosophy. But throughout that entire history of philosophy, uh, women, women do exist. And one of the important things to point to is, is where they do exist and when they do exist to point out who they are um, and to learn as much as we can about mm. the work that exists. So on the one hand, feminist philosophers are involved in recuperative work, finding that work that does exist. It's, it's not easy to do, obviously, um, but championing it once, um, mm -hmm. once that work is found and discussed. And there are some very, very high profile and classic cases and, and names there. And the work of those women philosophers who haven't been mainstream but who have existed it is just fabulous work. Now, I find it very hard to disagree with that. I mean, that seems like valuable work. I come at it from the perspective that because I think men and women do think a little bit differently, female insights can give you a new perspective on ideas that you know the male mind can't necessarily solve or that the male mind doesn't see quite as clearly or from that particular angle. So I buy the idea that throughout history there is some degree of silencing of women's voices. And I think that means the project of trying to hear those voices is valuable. But again, I think the closer we get to the modern era, the less I'm convinced that the reason we have relatively few female philosophers is because they're literally excluded from the profession. So those voices exist, and we want to claim those voices. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, women have been sadly num lacking in number and, and you know, effectively we, we have been marginalized and, mm -hmm. and in many instances excluded and silenced, and that's a problem. So then we had a brief exchange about something I love talking about, which is the relationship that my wife and I have had in the context of philosophy. So my wife, Julia, is my partner in philosophy. Pretty much every idea that I feel like is good enough to bring to market, I run by Julia, we talk about it. She hits me with skepticism. She's always my first line proofreader. She pokes holes in my argument. I try to poke holes in hers. And on top of that, entirely due to her existence, I think I kind of discovered the meaning of life, which is love. So my philosophy is massively impacted by my wife, my, as is my ethical system. So I wondered if part of the reason that women aren't as well represented in terms of works of philosophy that we read is because they're playing this massively important role behind the scenes. So the men maybe get the public credit, but behind them is all of the work, the conversations, the insight, the support that goes unseen. Perhaps that is part of the reason that we see this disparity. What I think is that the idea of a man and a woman, two people, being able to explore and express and and motivate each other to think more carefully about issues, whether they be love or reason or rationality or whatever, um, that this is a marvelous thing. I think this is a fabulous thing. Mm -hmm. But that's occurred historically within the context of, let us just loosely refer to it as a, a patriarchal social context. Now that's changed from time to time and that's changed from place to place. Patriarchy doesn't exist in the same form in, in all, under all circumstances. But what I mean by that is that structurally what happens is that it, what might even occur within the context of a really supportive relationship between two people then is contextualized within a social context that says the man is usually paid for that work and gets the social recognition in the public sphere, whereas the woman's contribution to that becomes the silent foundation hmm. of, of the identity that that man then, then builds and develops through his public career. Now, the part that I might disagree with here is the implication that this is kind of nefarious, that there's a social context in which everybody thinks, oh, you know, the woman doesn't get the credit, the man did the work. I'm not sure if putting it in that kind of negative social context is necessary. A good example of this is mothers. Pretty much everybody knows that mothers do a kind of unsung heroic work. They do this massively important job raising kids raising future people, and yet they often get virtually no credit. I don't think that's because society doesn't value mothers. 
I just think it's the nature of that role is one that is generally less in the public eye, for better and for worse. Why do you think that's the case? That there is this, the male, I think that's a good way of putting it, the male gets paid for it or is seen as like the uh, part of his career and then the, the woman most frequently not as much. Why is that the case if that's kind of a social thing? So that's the first question, go ahead. Can we go straight to yeah. that then? Well, very simply at one level, it's because structurally at various times, women are literally excluded from the public domain. So they, they cannot or have not obtained work, paid work, um, at, in this case, as philosophers. So it's the, economically, ideologically, culturally, there are ways of excluding women from the public domain. So in one sense, one of the important things that we need to talk about is the fact that you've got these various oppositions in Western culture, not only in Western culture, but specifically for us, and, and they vary over time and place too, but you've, let's say we've got man and woman, we've got men and women, we've got masculinity and femininity, but we've also got the public and the private. And the public domain, historically, this is what patriarchy, how we can define patriarchy in one sense, if you like, the public domain is the domain that, that men have a privileged access to. Men go back and gain sustenance and support in the private domain, in and through the family, in and through the wife, the partner, in and through the mother, importantly. Um, but they then, once sustained and nourished, they go back out into the public domain to be um, social subjects or citizens or whatever they become. And historically, women have had limited access to that public domain. I think there's some truth mixed in with some ambiguity here. So first of all, the, the ambiguity is the tense, the verb tense. Is this what's happening at present, or is this a historical description of what has happened? Very important, and we get into it in a minute. But where I think there's truth is that women really have been barred or discouraged, at the very least, from pursuing careers which are seen as traditionally male-dominated. I'm not talking about being a firefighter. I'm talking about being in the intellectual sphere. My guess is that part of the reason for these social structures isn't fully nefarious. Like I said, I don't think it's a cabal of men getting together, wringing their hands and saying, ah, how can we exclude the opposite sex from the workplace? I think it's something like this, that men and women are different. Our brains work differently. On average, we choose different careers from one another, and so you get a kind of natural striation in the social order. I don't have any problem with that as long as it's natural and people are freely making choices. But then I think you get a type of people, let's call them social authoritarians, who think that those natural patterns need to be enforced, that those natural patterns are the way it must be, that women in general choose more nurturing career paths or more nurturing work than men, and if a woman chooses otherwise, well, that's not her place. Or a, a modern version, I'd say, of the social authoritarian are those radical feminists. I don't think my guest is one of them, but those radical feminists who disparage women for choosing traditional gender roles. So if a woman wants to be a homemaker, she wants to be a mother, she wants to go into the service sector, she wants to be a nurse, traditionally female roles, now the, the social authoritarian says, oh, you're promoting the patriarchy, you shouldn't make that decision, you should go be an engineer, or be a philosopher, or a politician. I'm not a fan of these social authoritarians. I think there's a balance here. You can respect that men and women are different. In general, they're going to be choosing different careers, but for those who don't fall into that, that average bell curve, that's totally fine. If you're a man that wants to live your life in a way that's seen as traditionally feminine, great. If you're a woman that wants to be an engineer, a computer scientist, you want to take on a traditionally masculine career, great. So long as you're freely doing it, as long as you're being true to yourself, I don't think people have any reason to stick their nose into your business and even have an opinion on the matter. So it's not surprising that women have had limited access to yeah. careers in philosophy or to identities as philosophers. Well, that's exactly the second question that I wanted to ask you about. When we apply that lens historically, I think that's 
pretty clear, especially if you read some of the writing of various philosophers on their thoughts about women, it's pretty explicitly uh, that they're not fit for this particular domain. So do you think that that is still the standard Western culture today? Because when I, when I would have these conversations with people and when I interact with the world, at least, I mean, I've only been around for a couple of decades, but it doesn't seem like it has that same um, explicit exclusion from the workplace. So that's the first question. Do you think that the, that type of deliberate exclusion from the workplace is still going on today? And if not, where did things start changing? Okay, well, there's, there's ways of thinking about this. And one is that you have periods where women are literally excluded from the public domain or the workplace or, or the institutional practice of philosophy. And that's obviously problematic. Um, but there are, we can say now that, that in certain Western countries, in certain parts of the Western world, women now have that access. Mm. That access, though, is still mediated because that access depends on available finances, and we know that women are financially less um, less well off than men. We know statistically that's the case. Hang on, uh, I need a citation on that one. I'm assuming she's talking about the gender pay gap, which in pretty much every version is a load of baloney. I've seen gender pay gap arguments that are so crude as to literally add together all of the money that men make, all of the money that women make, divide that number by how many men and women there are, and say, aha, men are paid on average X percent more than women, and that's evidence of the patriarchy and double standards. Some of those analyses don't even account for differences in jobs, differences in how many hours men and women work, differences in the relative risks that are associated with different jobs. So if you're a lineman working on live telephone wires, chances are you're a man, and chances are you're making a ton of money because you're taking a huge risk by being up on those telephone poles. So pretty much every way you split the gender wage gap, it fails to show anything substantive. And maybe that's not what she's talking about, I'm not sure. But there's a bunch of really great work online just eviscerating this notion that won't seem to die, that, you know, men get paid a buck... 20 for every dollar that a woman makes or something like that. So there are all there are still prohibitions or, or mediations that make it difficult mm. for women to access, in, the, say, the institutional study. But even when women do access the institutional study or even a career in philosophy, there are still dangers and pitfalls. And some of those uh, go along the lines of what kind of philosophy do you do once you're there? Mm -hmm. So it's not just enough to, to study philosophy or to become a philosopher, but do you then get a chance to, in a sense, think independently, write independently, or do you, enact, which, which historically has also been the case for some women who've gained that privileged access, they've become faithful, faithful, um, um, faithful kind of disciples of male philosophers mm. and have worked, often these philosophers are long dead, but they've often become faithful commentators on the work of these philosophers in an attempt to make sure that the, the work of that particular philosopher lives on, while not in a sense promoting their own work mm -hmm. or their own independent thought. That's what I'm, I'm not saying that happens all the time, it doesn't, <laughs> not by any means, but historically, as women have made partial gains into the public domain, um, it hasn't always been the case that just accessing the public domain has been enough for women mm. to actually become philosophers in their own right. So if I understand her argument correctly, she's saying that because in some cases women are commenting on the ideas of other thinkers rather than creating their own ideas, this is also evidence of some kind of discriminatory structure in professional philosophy. I mean, my perspective is this is a problem of academia. It's not a problem having to do with men or women. It's a problem that academics in general with stuck within the system are faced with. There's countless, countless papers written by men commenting on the ideas of obscure thinkers about ideas that don't matter and will never matter just because they face the economic incentives to publish or perish within the academic system. The amount of critical independent reasoning taking place within the academy, especially in philosophy, as far as I can tell, is approaching nil. So how would you respond to somebody that says, 
the the key part is that women have the access kind of structurally and culturally that people aren't ex explicitly saying you know you can't have this career as a woman that's that is important and let's say that that's been achieved in the west that there's not there's not you know, a gender requirement for being a philosopher how would you respond to somebody saying the discrepancy that we see in the the different um, areas of research from biology to philosophy to social sciences and economics those gender differences are based on the choices of women so if somebody said women in general aren't usually as interested in original contributions to philosophy as men how would you respond to that I obviously I disagree <laughs> but I'd, I'd look again to the structural the structural um, conditions that that support or or don't support women in educational possibilities and I'd say I don't think it's ever the case that women are not interested in those things but I would say that again structurally young girls and young women are often dissuaded in a range of complex ways from having an interest in those things mm. and I think that's a different thing. This seems to presuppose the idea that without cultural influences we would have a kind of 50-50 split. Men and women in every single field there would be no differences that women and men would naturally tend to choose the same things. I see no evidence of this and, and I see mountains of evidence to the contrary. The best thinker I've ever encountered along these lines is Thomas Sowell. He does incredible deep analyses of differences in social groups. So for example, why is it that immigrant Chinese all over the world tend to have higher socioeconomic status than immigrant Africans? Well, he says, it's not biology, it's cultural differences. It's they tend to choose different things. And specifically when he's talking about immigrant populations coming to the same country, he says, they were different when they got on the boat, so they're different when they got off the boat. In other words, differences in culture are going to naturally reflect in socioeconomic differences. I think the same things at play here. Differences in men and women are naturally going to play out in differences in choices that those men and women make. Can you give some examples of, of that, like where they would start? And... Well, it, that's complex, Steve, and I think, again, that comes back to really basic ideas or the really basic oppositions that still throb in the heart of the Western cultural imaginary. And that is something along the lines of we still have this division, this oppositional division between reason or rationality on the one hand and irrationality. Mm. We still have this division between reason and emotion. We still think prim primarily in terms of body and or mind and body. And the problem is that particularly with the, that dichotomy or that opposition between reason and irrationality, it is still, it has historically been and is still in the contemporary day used to ground the difference between men and women mm. and masculinity and femininity in really often subtle ways, sometimes not so subtle too, but whether from advertising to, um, you know, to scientific discourses and um, the, the presumptions that go behind certain scientific methodologies or philosophical methodologies, we still can find plenty of evidence of this separation of reason and, and uh, irrationality okay. alighting with um, masculinity and femininity. And I would add, I think that's a good thing. I don't care if you call reasonability masculine. Reasonability in the sphere of philosophy is a good thing. I'm not exactly sure what she's getting at here. It sounds like she's saying that we have a distinction between reason and emotion, that we view a rational method as better than an emotional method, is somehow sexist or biased towards men because women are seen as being more emotional and irrational? If that's what she's claiming, then I would say unabashedly any influence towards the acceptance and tolerance of irrationality or emotionalism in philosophy is a bad thing. If you want to call that feminist philosophy, you want to call the, the influence of women, that's a horrible thing. I think that's very insulting to women, too. I married a very rational woman who would not in any way want standards to be lowered so that we try to demasculinize rationality. Now, again, I'm not exactly sure if that's what she's saying. It seems a bit vague to me. 
So if you guys kind of understand what she's getting at, then feel free to correct me in the comments. So in something like you said, there are the presuppositions in, in our approaches to um, scientific inquiry. My intuition is to think, of course, I'm open to being wrong here. My intuition is to think that some division between rational and irrational, not on gender lines, but some division between those spheres is correct, that there is something like rational thinking about something and there is irrational thinking about something. Are you saying that that division itself is, is a mistaken division, or are you saying that when it's tied to gender, that's when that's a mistake? I think it's a difficult thing. Mm. I think um, that we all intuitively feel comfortable with the sense that there, there are reasonable statements and there are irrational statements, mm -hmm. or there are reasonable worlds and irrational worlds particularly in the modern time. <laughs> um, but it is that overlay. It's the, really seri um, the series of very complex interconnections between reason and rationality and masculinity and scientific notions of proof and evidence and whatever. It's, it's the interconnections that separate femininity and the feminine and woman and, and passionate um, spheres from those realms. That, that to me, is the, the most obvious problem. All right, now I'm going to go out on a limb here and try to interpret that. Maybe I'm going to be wrong, but it sounds like what she's saying is this notion of scientific reality is an idea that generally comes from men. It's a kind of a the, traditional male way of thinking about things, and it's a problem that if we demasculinized our way of thinking about reality, then we would see that it's more soft than that, perhaps. That perhaps emotion should play a larger role in our epistemological process. Now, if that's what she means, then I'm of the persuasion to say, okay, well, the, the soft line of thinking actually probably should be excluded. <laughs> Because that's reality is the way that it is. We can grasp at it through various methods. There's a right way of doing it, and there's a wrong way of doing it. If we were to take the line of reasoning that said, you know, the feminist way of approaching science is that reality is a little fuzzier, or as you might say, a little more complex, it's less concrete than we men think it is, then I'd say, nope, that's a wrong-headed belief system for reasons I can point out, and I think it is rather insulting on behalf of rational women that one of the claims of feminist philosophers, if not Dr. Michelle Boulos Walker, then others who've written about science, that they argue the general scientific method is this male-dominated patriarchal line of inquiry and reasoning about the natural world, as if it's a bad thing. So are you saying that the way that, that kind of the standard approach to science, the reason, evidence, logic, data gathering, very linear approach. Are you saying that that is itself something which is masculine or that is, are you saying that that is socially considered as being the masculine yeah. approach to how we... Definitely the latter. I, d yeah. it, I don't see it as masculine yeah. uh, and I certainly don't see it as male, but I do see it as a tradition that many men have been engaged in. Mm -hmm. And I like to think of these things more in terms of a kind of cultural imaginary that we have this this kind of set of beliefs about reality which we don't question very readily uh, about how we divide the world, how we understand the world. And our, our beliefs about masculinity and femininity are structured by this imaginary, not by reality, but mm. by this imaginary. So this is operating at a not yet conscious level, really. Um, and, and that's important that... Um, that then just does so much work in determining or structuring the possibilities of little boys and little girls and and various groups, um, you know, from an early stage on. Again, it sounds like this is a criticism of the scientific way of thinking about the world. I mean, I've got my own criticisms of scientism, but it comes from kind of a rationalist scientific perspective. What I do find remarkable is a couple of claims here near the end where she said, this is operating at a not yet conscious level. Hmm. If that's true, lots of questions about the metaphysics of how that works, but how does she have access to it? Which ties into the second question, which is she's talking about this as like a cultural structure. 
It's remarkable to me that some people view themselves as being able to speak on behalf of culture or to be able to get into the cultural psyche that is somehow external to just their belief system. They've tapped into the public mindset, the public not yet conscious mindset. I readily admit I'm not able to do that, or at the very least I'm not able to make confident proclamations about the state of the not yet conscious cultural mind. I do ask her some more direct questions about the metaphysics of what she's talking about a little later on. So if I were to try to rephrase that, correct me if I'm wrong, is your claim that even the way that most people conceive of the nature of the world, of reality, is already structured in maybe an incorrect fashion, that even the way that we approach thinking about the world already contains some kind of a an elimination of possibilities. What I'd say is that it's mediated mm -hmm. and that for us reality is connected with a set of fantasies as well. And I don't mean that that's absolutely terrible and impossible. That's just the way I think things operate. We have a kind of fantastic view of reality in a sense. And in that we separate these notions of masculinity and femininity out all too strongly. And that's because the overlying structure, or let's call it really the underlying structure, is still a patriarchal one. If our society were not patriarchal, the imaginary wouldn't separate masculinity out into the superior categories of rationality and femininity out into the inferior mm. categories of irrationality. I do not understand this. Is the patriarchy so deeply lodged in our communal subconscious, not yet conscious mind? that it affects fundamentally the way that we approach reality and the way that we think about reality is structured in terms of male and female because of the patriarchal mind, I really don't know. But just to go back a step too, you mentioned before, or you asked whether or not I saw that as a, a fair distinction or not, um, rationality and irrationality. I guess intuitively, you know, I do. But at the same time, I acknowledge, along with a, a lot of other philosophers, that rationality and irrationality are not it's not a fixed relation and it's not a fixed opposition it's absolutely historically constructed it changes it varies it 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 modifies and that that's important mm -hmm. um, we have in the west we have dominant ways of of thinking about those terms rationality mm -hmm. and irrationality but the claims of rationality largely produce the question of what is irrational. So <laughs> irrationality doesn't exist in its own right. It is the kind of, pro it's produced through the imaginary of, of rationality, if you like, if that makes sense. I don't know, the imaginary, can we debate this? What is this theory, the imaginary, is this fundamental? I don't understand it. Here's a candidate for universal timeless insanity. Somebody believes that a logical contradiction is true. They believe that squares can be circular, that dogs can be not dogs, that bachelors can be married. That, as far as I can tell, is an objective criteria, perhaps one of the only objective criteria for determining sanity, logical consistency. Or, specifically, if somebody rejects the law of identity, meaning they think something is the way that it is not, then that means they're crazy. They could be crazy 5,000 years ago, or they could be crazy 10,000 years in the future. That's always going to be crazy. You, you use the term the fantastical and the imaginary for, for talking about how, descriptions of reality. Can you unpack that a little bit more for me? So are you saying that we really don't have any kind of reasonable connection or, or reliable connection to the nature of the world, and we're and it were kind of making things up because when I think of those words that's just what comes to mind yeah. it's, it's fantastic it's just like storytelling that may or may not correspond to anything it's not as it's not as um, extreme as it seems <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that we are out of touch with reality I just think realistically that reality is produced you know in in the sense that we overlay from the experiences and the events of our lives we overlay uh, a whole realm of cultural knowledge or cultural history or, or the, what I was referring to before as the imaginary and that filter we filter our reality through those those beliefs and values that we have inherited largely um, 
So no, I'm not trying to pretend that you know reality is is that we are totally out of touch with reality. Intuitively, we have a sense of what's happening around us, but our relation with everything that happens around us is also mediated at a, a somewhat not quite conscious level um, by by unacknowledged assumptions, beliefs, and prejudices. So again, I think there's a bit of truth mixed in with some vagueness here. This is, I think, a pretty common line of reasoning that people have. They think that reality is constructed because what they conceive of as reality is the nature of their experiences or the content of their experiences. They'll say things like, maybe reality is out there, but all I experience is my representation of reality. So my reality is different from your reality because your experience of the world is different. I think that's a bad way of using the term reality. It might be true that my experience of the world is different from yours. In other words, my perspective is a different perspective than yours. But the cause of the phenomena that we're experiencing can still be an objective and external reality. So if you and I are looking at a vase between us, your perspective on the vase is going to be different than my perspective on the vase. Your internal picture of the world is going to look different from my internal picture of the world. That doesn't mean your reality is different from my reality. It means your representation of reality is different than my representation of reality. The cause of our experiences is the bits of matter located in space in the external world, which is impinging upon our senses and representing the world to us in two different ways. But we can still talk about it, and those two different pictures of reality are still going to usually have a heck of a lot in common. Now, it's also true to say that there are some measure of subconscious belief systems which also impact the way that the world is represented to us. A good example would be your religious beliefs. So if you believe that God is actively intervening in your everyday life, it's not something, an idea you're consciously holding, it's it's in your subconscious belief system, that as you interact with the world, you're going to be seeing signs of God everywhere. If you believe that everybody is looking at you funny, a subconscious belief, you have insecurity problems, then the way that you're interacting with the world is going to be different because your representation of the world is going to be taking every glance as if somebody's judging you. So I agree, those belief systems definitely affect the way that the world is represented to us. However, I still think it's an external reality, and I think it's the case that these subconscious beliefs aren't external to our own minds. There's not a cultural mindset. There's not this kind of abstract community thought or community way of thinking. As far as I can tell, all beliefs are located in the mind or minds of individuals. So if you've got a cultural belief, all that means is you've got a set of beliefs yourself in your mind, which is shared by other people in their minds, not by the group mind. A lot of what we've been talking about comes back to the question of philosophy, not just as an institution, although that's that's really important, but philosophy as a discipline. And a lot of what we've been talking about is, is kind of, maybe it's a little clearer when we think about what it is that philosophy as a discipline is or what it does. Disciplines on, on the whole are mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion. So philosophy sets itself up in the West as a discipline at specific times and places. And in doing that, it excludes whole worlds outside of itself Mm. and says that's not philosophy. And to a large extent, philosophy philosophy starts by, by its definition or its disciplinary nature is to say philosophy is not what's irrational, or philosophy is not what's feminine, Hmm. or philosophy is not what's literary, or any number of other things. And so its definition often starts in a negative sense. And then reason, rationality, um, careful consideration, ideas like this, are often then seen as counters to what's irrational. Hmm. So one of the things that I'm trying to suggest here is that masculinity and femininity get mapped onto that complex process and that in philosophy the the whole notion of discipline is to include and exclude and in that sense masculinity and femininity get caught up in that inclusion and exclusion and Mm. on the whole in the west masculinity gets included inside all of the positive terms and values, whether they be reason or rationality or whatever they are, and femininity gets constructed outside 
of that disciplinary boundary. So on one level, we can just simply say that masculinity is a kind of inside to philosophy and femininity is a kind of mm -hmm. outside. So of course that explains historically why women have been excluded from philosophy on the whole. But the, the situation is so much more complex because by setting up a, an excluded zone outside of the discipline of philosophy, philosophy actually has brought the feminine into its core because it needs the notion of the feminine to define itself against. So it's central to philosophy, even though it's kind of silenced in that center. Okay. Where does this theory come from? Is this an empirical claim? Is this a theoretical claim? Is this self-evident? Where does this insight come from that philosophy defines itself as being masculinized by contrast to the non-philosophic, which is the feminine? And so though philosophy as a discipline is necessarily exclusive, it's actually including what it tries to exclude because it wouldn't be itself if it didn't exclude something. I mean, maybe. I could come up with lots of other theories. What's the reason for believing these claims? That's what I want to know. Because as it's presented, it just strikes me as kind of fanciful storytelling, as a way to try to paint the history of philosophy or the discipline as philosophy in terms of a struggle between the masculine and the feminine, which seems like an artificial imposition onto our concept of what philosophy is. Also, an interesting thought is that what claims does one object to here? Where is the room for discussion? Is it when we say, well, really, the whole exclusionary thing, no, that's not right. Disciplines don't have to be defined by what they exclude. Or maybe we, we say, well, no, th what has been included isn't necessarily masculinized, and what's excluded is feminized. Actually, it's a mixture of the two. I mean, with claims like this, there's so broad, so many huge a priori theoretical claims, I, I don't even know what to doubt. So the, the normal spatial logics that we'd think about in terms of inside and out, women and men inside, women out, fe masculine inside, masculine out, a feminine out, these don't operate really so in that direction. They are so much more complex and philosophy has, is inhabited by what it's trying to expel. So if we set up those parameters and we say, okay, masculine on the inside, by definition, we're going to say that means the other stuff on the outside, which would be caught up and that would be femininity. Nature's out there too. We should never forget nature and a whole host of other things. So, okay, so can you give me some specifics for claims that are... So if, if, if I were to say something like, Philosophy can be understood as pursuing the true nature of the way things are in the world. That's the kind of a really abstract way of, of thinking about it. Can you give me an example of where that would exclude like the feminine part of that, the femininity in that conception? The, the, your description is philosophy is the... Philosophy is the pursuit of... The truth, truth, the truth, and or trying to explain the all the phenomena that we experience in some kind of coherent way. Well, at a basic level, I mean, some of the feminist epistemologists would respond to that by saying, "Whose truth, um, and whose whose particular journey, uh, you know, whose which journey is this that we're specifically talking about? How do we proceed?" What, what are our methodologies, mm -hmm. and, and who's limiting the question of truth here? Then those individuals would have a mistaken understanding of the nature of what truth is and what existence is. Whose truth might be a compelling response to somebody who's a relativist or somebody who's not read my book, Square One, The Foundations of Knowledge, which you can buy on Amazon. But there's no my truth or your truth. There is the truth, which is the way things actually are in the world. So maybe to put it more simply, Steve, is to say at any given time, who the philosopher that is undertaking that particular pursuit, the, the daily, the real bodily experiences and, and context of that philosopher matter. The fact 
of who that philosopher is, what that philosopher is, where that philosopher is, or when that philosopher is, mm. that matters. And mm. so the question of truth then is contextualized a little more than, than uh, eternalized. This line of thinking was popular with the Marxists back in the day. They saw intellectual claims as being kind of representations of class philosophy. So there's bourgeois logic, there's proletariat logic. In this case, there's the philosopher in the 21st century's logic and the philosopher's 14th century's logic. It's all relative based on kind of socioeconomic and cultural differences, rather than there being one eternalized truth, as she put it. This position is wrong and self-refuting. These philosophers are making eternal truth claims about eternal truth claims. In other words, they're saying it is true that X, Y, Z, and in doing so they have presupposed the eternality and objectivity of the truth. So when you ask the question, um, who's truth, that comes, that question is also a statement about a, uh, the nature of truth, what we mean by the term truth. When, when you ask the question, or when a, when a feminist epistemologist would ask that question, is the claim that the nature of truth is itself kind of um, unique to the individual pursuing it, or is the claim that there is no such thing as this, what we think of as this objective truth out there that everybody, is, everybody has access to, does that, is that itself a kind of claim about the nature of truth? There are so many different perspectives on this, honestly, <laughs> and it's not... It's not for me to actually um, answer that question, but what I would do is to say, go and look at the myriad different approaches for, to feminist epistemology that have emerged in the last you know, couple of decades. It's amazing what's out there. And each of those approaches will give you a slightly different okay. response. Um, as I mean, it's not dissimilar to the fact that epistemology generally will give you those kinds of incredibly mm -hmm. varied responses. Feminist epistemology is, is similar in that sense, that it, there's, uh, there's such an array of different possible responses there. On the one hand, I think that's a fair response to say, well, I can't speak on behalf of everybody. On the other hand, I have this sneaking suspicion that it would be very difficult to answer the question that I posed, because either way that you answer, you're going to be setting yourself up for some difficult follow-up questions. This is a kind of rhetorical technique that I've seen many times. I don't know if it's at play here, but I've seen many times where people will make grand, remarkable claims, and then when you ask a little more specific to, get, to try to get very clear is what you mean by X such and such, they say, well, it's very complex, or it's very difficult, or maybe they kind of shift the subject matter. Maybe they say, well, it's not for me to say. So it's a way where you can get a bunch of ideas out there like truth is relative to the speaker of it. And then if anybody presses you on it, you can say, well, you know, it's not really for me to say. You can check out the work of these other philosophers. So one question that we didn't talk a lot about, but I really want to know, I want to go into more detail with you, is if somebody were to say that distinctions we see in the pursuit of different fields, not just in terms of um, academic pursuits, but also career pursuits. We see, you know, a very large amount percentage-wise of, you know, startup founders or men, let's say. In my observations of the world, I do see differences on average, there are certainly exceptions, between the behavior of your stereotypical man, the behavior of your stereotypical woman, or I would say it seems like the individual choices on net that are being made by women seem to be less um, risky isn't the right word, risky in an economic sense. So the, that, the, to, to be the founder of a startup, seems to be itself a more masculine decision or something like that. So do you think that those kind of traits that we see really are purely as a, as a function of social constructions and kind of cultural conditioning or do you think that there is a genuine difference between the choices that women make on their own free will or the, and the choices that men make well again you've asked a lot of questions <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <Really> all together <laughs> it's complex but one would answer please <laughs> yeah <laughs> um number one i guess i've got I've got to think about the word choices there mm -hmm. because for me choices, I mean we can get caught in a very liberal individualist kind of um, way of thinking there 
And I want to resist that in some senses, that choices don't occur um, in, in any free context. Um, choices occur within a context that already I've been referring to here as, as patriarchal in that sense. Okay, so that's a very critical claim here, very central, is even the notion of free choice, she's saying, is only understood in the context of the existing patriarchy, that the patriarchy runs so deep as to exclude the existence of men and women truly making free choices. So if we talk about, if we try and put these two things side by side, men's choices and women's choices, mm -hmm. Already we have this intuition that the way men choose and the way women choose is maybe not equal. And that goes into a whole range of different experiences and educational possibilities and limitations that may or may not have occurred within those contexts. So it does come back to the sense that if you've got a culture that is reinforcing in subtle and not so subtle ways time and time again that men are active and defiant and and risk-taking mm -hmm. and women are risk averse and um, more passive and and more relational then it won't be very surprising to find that that may or may not be the case mm -hmm. if we go and do some empirical evidence out in in the, the world of startups but to me that doesn't confirm a difference between masculinity and femininity it, it suggests more that masculinity and femininity are still linked to these defining kind of oppositional terms or couples in the Western imaginary, male-female, rationality, irrationality, active-passive mm -hmm. in this account. I mean, that's a really important one. Active, activity and passivity mm -hmm. is, is prime against a, a way, you know, way of, of thinking through how we can understand the difference between man and woman or masculinity and femininity. So the claim is that it's a more plausible theoretical explanation for the differences between men and women to say that in the not yet conscious cultural psyche, the patriarchy is so deeply lodged that women don't really freely make the choices that they make, though in practice they seem to make decisions that are l less risky than men. In reality, that's just because the choice has been taken off the table for them. To me, this seems a bit insulting to say, hey, women, you guys think you're actually freely choosing things. You think you actually hold these values because you are a rational agent. But no, in reality, even your decisions, when nobody's pushing you into what career path you're going to go, you've got a loving and supporting family. No, your mind is still framed by the patriarchy that seems to somewhat take away your own free will. So in a hypothetical scenario, if you were to interview, let's say, 50 different women, and most of them say, I'm not really interested in philosophy, or I'm not really interested in doing a startup, they might report, they might say, it's my own free decision to make. But would you say they're even in the way that they're conceiving of their choices, it's already going to be, it's already going to be kind of framed for them? I, to some extent, yes, but I think that's absolutely true for young men as well, mm -hmm. because, you know, young men will see themselves as, as, as more actively pursuing, more risk-taking, more challenging projects. Um, so it's something that occurs on both levels, I think. So in a society where you didn't have that, let's just idealize a society, do you think that we would see a equal distribution of career choices and life choices between the sexes? Well, part of what feminism is, is, a, is to think utopian, in a utopian manner. And yes, we can all think toward this notion where, yes, all of those things would be possible. But then we're talking about a society that would uncouple those conceptual connection. So you would uncouple masculinity from rationality, from activity, from um, risk, risk taking, and you would uncouple femininity from passivity, from irrationality or, or whatever sets of um, oppositions you want to talk about. That's no easy task, obviously. <laughs> um, but, but it's an important task, and that's partially the work of feminism. Notice how that was complete aversion of the question. 
question is incredibly important. If we could get to this utopian society, would the decisions and the career choices that men and women make, would they be split equally? If the answer is yes, where's the evidence? Where's the theory that backs this up? If the answer is no, there would still be career and life choice difference between the sexes because men and women are different yikes that's a slippery slope because then you say okay well then how much of a difference would there be and how do you know so it's a catch-22 if you say that there would be no difference you've got no evidence whatsoever to back that up and then tons of evidence to the contrary and if you say yes there would be a difference well that kind of concedes the point and now you're just talking about a measure of scale which you got to somehow back up your arguments saying, oh, there would actually be, the distribution would be 37% women being startup founders instead of 10% or whatever it is. So, okay, maybe a, maybe a better way for me to ask this. So we, kind of the starting point is there are biological differences. So we would agree that there are biological differences. That's complex. Okay. <laughs> Interesting choice of words. That's complex. If you go back and listen to the full interview, whenever that word comes up that's complex or that's difficult, a little red flag should go up. It's actually not very difficult to say what is patently obvious, that yes, there are definitely biological differences between men and women. There are obviously differences, right. but biology never occurs outside of culture. So the way that we determine what, bio what those biological differences are the, the, that way is is always going to be mediated again by mm. the social context so yes of course there are bodily differences mm -hmm. but what those bodily differences are can be absolutely um, discussed to me this is just my theory to me this sounds like putting a stake in the grounds that one could come back to later because the argument that I'm making is very straightforward. You know, men and women are biologically different. We think a little bit differently and therefore why wouldn't we assume that that's going to play out in terms of life choices that we make? If she can make a little asterisk here at the biological differences, now, now she can say, well, actually, maybe biological differences are only understood in a cultural context and the cultural context is the problem which kind of throws a little bit of cloudiness into the whole situation. So maybe what we think are objective physical biological differences are in fact only perceived as such because of a cultural, rational, Western scientific patriarchal mindset that we're bringing to the table. Okay, so let's say there are bodily differences and let's not quite get to the cultural implications of what, where those bodily differences manifest and how we describe them, but there are bodily differences. Do you think that also applies to the mind and the way that the, those um, bodily differences give rise to different physical traits that we have? Do you think it would also give rise just naturally, starting with the, the bodily differences, to different ways of thinking? It's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see why that's a loaded question. It seems like a very straightforward question. My guess, because I believe my guest is very smart, is that she didn't like where this line of questioning was going to lead. Um, let me backtrack. Let me backtrack and say that there are bodily differences, but biology and body and difference take on different values, are valued differently in different contexts. And so the values of those differences are, are not stable and not fixed. So the way that we absolutely appreciate and understand those differences is complex. It's really complex. And we really don't give enough credit to how complex that is. Mm -hmm. Remember what I said about the word complex? Yes, so that one was complex. It's complex. It's really complex. I actually do think there are differences, of course, uh, between bodies. Um, and those are now complex differences because the question of masculine, feminine, or male, female is not the only range that we have to consider. Mm -hmm. But um, I do think there are differences, and I do think those differences give rise to different experiences mm -hmm. um, with some obvious examples um, on both sides. Uh, but but the, the way that we come to understand or appreciate what that means is complex, and it's still occurring within a context that values masculinity and mm. devalues femininity.
So is the claim that, yes, there are bodily differences, but even by saying so, we've said that men are superior and women are inferior? We can't even mention what biological differences are without making some kind of cultural judgment? I must confess, I am skeptical. So if we were to take the line of reasoning that said there are bodily differences that are manifested as somebody gets older and we have you know what we what we call men and what we call women in a biological sense you're going to see you know men in general have careers of doing manual labor for bodily differences you're going to see more lumberjacks let's say that have those bodily differences that to me would ex- would largely explain some career choices the literal you know the, the big beefy guy is going to have a more successful career doing big beefy things and somebody skinny and wimpy like me is, is going to be is not going to have a successful career doing uh, difficult things um, so that that I could see the career discrepancy there but are if we follow that line of reasoning would we say well some of those bodily differences are also mind differences and would naturally result in differences of choices so at this point when i said that there was a bit of tension in the air to say okay there there are physical differences between men really big beefy men are going to have successful lumberjack careers i'm not because i'm not big and beefy okay that's that's not controversial but if you say if you suggest that well there are mental differences ooh, you, you could but you know the hair on my skin probably raised a little bit as the tension in the room also raised like with women, for example, there's a dominance of women in like caretaking industries. Now, is that because this is something that is that women are more disposed to do for those bodily differences, or is it that those are uh, those emerge from our kind of cultural categorizations of how those people with the bodily differences should act? So, if somebody were to take the position that, you know, in in an, in a ideal society where you still have bodily differences, you would have a substantive striation of uh, people with these bodily differences do these career choices, these people with the other bodily differences have those other career choices. How would you respond to that? If I said even in an ideal world we'd see something like that. Oh, there's always going to be difference and, mm-hmm. and, and division of labor, of course, but I d- guess I don't agree with your line of thinking so much. What I would say, and certainly if you, we go back to your example of the, the worker in um, childcare, or was that the example that you gave? Yeah, so there, were, there was two. The one was the, the lumberjack mm. versus me. Well, I would be a terrible lumberjack. And then the childcare, which seems to be a more what we yeah. consider to be the feminine caring. Okay, kind of what I think about childcare is that it's, well, I'm going to approach this from a really different way. Mm-hmm. I want to say first that I think Childcare is one of the most important things that we could or should be doing in our society. Uh, it's the basis of so much. But because it has been historically associated with women and women's work and defined as women's work, it has no cultural value or it has very little cultural value, unfortunately. It's very poorly paid, at least in this country. It's very extremely poorly paid poorly remunerated and that goes along with its low status. It is at this point that I can no longer be polite. I must say this is almost certainly false. The reason that child care does not pay well is because of pure supply and demand. There are a lot of people who are able to supply child care, cheap child care. It's not a skilled position in an economic sense. You don't need a degree. You don't need formal training. That means there are a lot of young ladies in particular who are able to supply their services. There's a finite demand for those services, and therefore the going labor rate is very low. It's the same reason that being a lawnmower when you're 16 does not pay very well, because there's a lot of other people with that same exact skill set who can do the exact same job, and so your labor does not fetch a high price. To associate cultural value with economic wages is a mammoth mistake. Mammoth gigantic, cannot overstate it. Wages do not come from cultural value. They come from the laws of supply and demand in economics, period.
Now, all of this isn't because of the work that's done. It's very hard, it's very demanding, and it's very important work. But it goes along with the fact that by being considered the epitome of women's work, it's not really seen as work at all. Mm. And that that makes it possible for us to refuse to remunerate that work at a level that it should be remunerated at. Sorry, where does this should statement come from? It should be remunerated at a higher rate. Uh, should? According to whom? <laughs> Who makes these incredible declarations about what is the fair going rate that a laborer can get for the services that they're rendering to in their employers? Notice that she also imported another false theory in economics, which is the labor theory of value, that if somebody works really hard, they deserve a high wage. That's not the way that wages work. You get paid based on the value that you create relative to supply and demand for the service that you are providing. There are plenty of very difficult jobs which pay poorly because lots of people can do them, think farm labor, and there are plenty of fairly easy jobs which pay very well. You could think of being a tenured academic within the system. You don't have to produce very much and yet you get very, very high wages even if you don't create that much value in the world. And, and the fact that um, it is seen as, as non-professional work uh, and that it has very low cultural um, status, these things are all important. So it's that, to me, mm. that makes more sense of what's going on. Men are not going to be attracted to, to work um, of that status. I mean, I don't know the situation of lumberjacks. It's really outside of my <laughs> field of expertise. But I imagine that one of the things that may occur in the case of the lumberjack is that in exchange for extremely physical and possibly um, dangerous work, that there would be fairly good compensation. That's, that's a realm that's so often than not, not open to women. Interesting. So when you are viewing compensation for work, you're viewing it as this relationship with how a culture values that work being done. So if there's a low, you know, like the child care work is very low paid, you'd say that is directly correlated to how a culture values that work. Now she nodded here, she didn't say yes. But I'm going to pat myself on the back here because this is a great example of having extreme passionate deep disagreement with somebody and still remaining polite with them. I liked Dr. Bulas Walker, and we got along very well. She was very polite, we had a great conversation afterwards, and yet on this point, I think she's completely wrong, with huge implications. But I think we still remain friends. Well, maybe until she listens to this interview breakdown. See, my, my intuition is to view it more just in terms of economics or supply and demand or something like that. I would say, well, there's a, there's a huge amount of labor that's available for childcare. And so naturally we would have relatively low wages in that area just because there's so much supply that's available. And versus something like being a lumberjack, there's a lot fewer people that want to be lumberjacks. And so we would have the comp amount of compensation go up. How would you respond to something like that? Well, I'd have to resist from saying something like that it's delightfully naive, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> the irony. Honestly, I think it's inevitable whenever you're talking with somebody with these particular political dispositions, this particular worldview, it's just a matter of time before the condescension drips out. You see, it's a simple, naive understanding of the world to grasp the laws of supply and demand and understand where wages come from. No, instead we have to talk about deep-seated, not-yet-conscious, patriarchal cultural beliefs, which means that we all have a negative view of child care and a more positive view of lumberjacks, and that's where wages come from. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, on the left, there are very, very, very many cases of people that may have really good intentions but are completely clueless about even the most elementary laws of economics. They just don't understand how business works, especially because so many of them get stuck in academia. They never leave. They never experience the real world. They're genuinely unaware of business, of where wealth comes from, of what employment is. And so they come up with these theories about an employee's wages comes from his worth as an individual or whether or not society values him from a gender perspective or crazy things like this. 
<laughs> because I guess from my own perspective, I just think there's so much more over determining those what counts as work in the first place. Mm. And I think one of the problems with the question or the example of childcare is that it is not actually seen as work at all. <laughs> what? How do they get what? Why are they paid if it's not seen as work? Please t tell your theory to 16 year old girls all over the world who are not doing work and somehow are getting paid. Maybe they're just getting pay paid for their sheer worth as a valuable individual. When you say that it's not seen as work, why do you say that? If it's the case that people are getting some kind of compensation, why would we say, well, it's not seen as work? I think it comes back to what I was saying before or suggesting before about the division, again, in Western societies. It operates differently everywhere between the public and the private. Mm. I think childcare is this confusing state that is actually now occurring in the public domain, but it's seen in terms of its, you know, being the relic of the, the private domain. Um, Women are working now, and thus child care, paid childcare is needed. And yet it's a confusion of public and private. This is really a problem for the, the kind of the dominant imaginary, or the, we might even think of it as the capitalist imaginary here. No, I think capitalism has no problems with it. It can just extract surplus labor, and, and it's done with it. I don't think that's a problem. Whoa, extracting surplus labor, that's Marxist economics. That was definitely disproven over the course of the 20th century. But in the masculine or the patriarchal way that our society orients itself, this is work that really still should be happening unpaid and unseen in the private sphere. Hmm. And so it is not valued and it is not well paid. I have never in my life encountered anybody that has the thought that child care should go unpaid. That makes no sense to me. Now I can find some measure of agreement and say, hey, people probably don't appreciate how hard child care is. Okay, I agree with that. In no way does that mean, therefore, everybody deserves, has a, some moral entitlement to a larger wage. That's just not the way it works. Shoveling dung is also an incredibly difficult job. I wouldn't want it. And I respect those who are employed as dung shovelers. But that doesn't mean that because you've got a hard job that you're entitled to higher wages. It confounds, uh, having childcare in the public domain confounds the purity of the public sphere and the private sphere. And we're not supposed to confound those two things. I've never heard anybody express any kind of sentiment or belief remotely close to that. To me, this is just fanciful storytelling to try to piece together a narrative that has fallen apart in a very short amount of time. So, uh, surely this is not the only circumstance. You would say there are other areas in which there is this um, of two minds. You have the, the public sphere and the private sphere. Can you give some other examples of where this would be the case? Oh, the very obvious case is elderly care. Mm. Exactly the same mentality operating, the sense that this is traditionally women's unpaid work, mm. and it should be occurring in the private domain what on earth is it doing in the public domain? Okay, we have to do it, then let's devalue it and let's underpay it. I mean, what? As if there's some board of wealthy white men sitting around thinking these thoughts. Oh, what is this work doing in the public sphere? Oh, well, if it's there, I suppose we'll only give them five dollars an hour since that's a women's job. Kind of sounded like the emperor from Star Wars. The reason that elderly care and child care does not pay very well is because it is economically unskilled work. That means anybody can do it, assuming you have a functioning body, which means there's a very large supply of labor, not as large a demand, so the price that you can fetch for the labor is low. That's it. That's the only reason. That it should be an unpaid woman's job has no factor into the equation whatsoever. I, 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 where's the evidence of this? Do you think that that is a kind of a conscious thing? Do, people, do you think people are consciously thinking that or this is just all kind of behind the scenes is subconscious no no I don't think it's un I don't think it's conscious and I don't think it's um, subconscious I think it's not yet conscious or not quite conscious mm. um, these are the what I'm trying to suggest is that philosophy operates here in a more important way than we give it credit for these these conceptual divisions between the public and the private, these matter 
and yet they're not things that we tend to talk about in a conscious way mm -hmm. at work over the over the photocopier. Um, you know, we don't tend to think of well, how's your public and private you know, going today, Steve? Are you managing to mingle or not? Um, but I think. So, so in the West, we, we make these divisions. We have these conceptual oppositions that are hierarchically organized. We have the public up here and the private here. And the public is the domain of masculinity traditionally, and the private is the domain of femininity traditionally. According to whom? This is one weird conceptual scheme of thinking about how society operates. I certainly don't think this way. I doubt many people do. And she's acting as if, oh, this is just established. This is just the way that it is, and it's problematic. And so they, these impact in really significant ways in situations like work, in situations, in many other situations, in educational situations mm -hmm. as well, too. If you think about education, there's another... Um, similarity there. The younger the child, the younger the educator, or sorry, the younger the, the the level of education to the higher, the salary and the status goes up. So you start at the at kindergarten, what we would call kindergarten or or prep here, with low status and low salary. And by university, if you're teaching and educating at that level, you have more status and more mm -hmm. salary. Not terrific, but you know, <laughs> but more. And again, I think that's this sense that that as the child gets older, the child moves from the private to the public domain, and so that process of education becomes more validated. Yeah, or it's the case that as you go higher and higher up your level of education, it requires more and more skill from the teacher. Lots of people can teach kindergarten. Fewer people can teach 8th grade, fewer people can teach 12th grade, fewer people can teach college, fewer people than that can teach postdoc students. So as the supply of the laborer decreases, the wage that that individual can gain in the marketplace increases. This again is a completely crazy perspective on where prices come from. They come from the not yet conscious rather than simple supply and demand. This type of reasoning strikes me as purely religious, just theoretical, speculative religious in this weird narrative context, this weird ethical system that's not challenged. And it, I, I view it as kind of a tragedy, to be honest. So when you think of that kind of compensation for educational work, you're putting it in the context of how society in general values it. It's not as much supply and demand. It's not, you know, it requires more training or anything like that. It's, it, this is... Is this kind of like a manifestation almost of the uh, cultural values? Is that yeah, the way that, yeah okay. I certainly would see it in those terms. Supply and demand will come into it, but they will operate in complex ways on top of this division between public and private. I would like to hear how the theory of supply and demand is incorporated a little bit into this very unquestionable and obvious split between public and private and the gender associations therein. Can you unpack the metaphysics of that? It's not a subconscious belief, it's not a conscious belief, it's a not yet conscious belief. If we're gonna say, try to say precisely what is it or where is it, yeah, what is it? <laughs> so uh, when we, when we say that the society is kind of a manifestation of some of these cultural values prior to their manifestation, and where do they where are they located? Where, in like this public conscious, how does that work? Okay, complex, complex. <laughs> Let me try and respond to that. At one level, it comes back to what I've referred to before as a, a cultural imaginary, which sometimes manifests as a masculine imaginary. So it's this this very amorphous set of beliefs and values that, that exist at the not yet conscious level but that are shared um, by, in a dominant social form or a dominant cultural form. So maybe that's one way of thinking about it. But the other way of thinking about it comes right back to the fundamental metaphysical distinction between mind and body. And we tend to think of understanding and ideas and beliefs and whatever occurring at the purely conscious level of mind. What I would take from the phenomenological traditions um, is something more along the line of an embodied consciousness. So 
that's a complex way of saying or responding to your question, where does all of this kind of exist? Mm -hmm. Where does it lie? I think when things are not yet conscious, that's when we know that what we're, we're dealing with is an embodied consciousness. So it's not that our mind has all of the conscious contents and that our bodies know nothing of that. Mm. Uh, if we follow a philosopher like someone like, say, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, um, his notion of embodied consciousness makes sense because it's, it's consciousness that, in fact, we, the, the body subject carries with it or, or develops or, or has. Um, and that, that's, that can become conscious, that knowledge or that, that belief or that idea can become conscious, mm. but it also remains at a level not yet conscious. And that that's, it's p impacting on us without us consciously being aware of it. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, think about this. The, no, the metaphysical notion of the not yet conscious, of the patriarchy, all these belief systems, this is central. This is absolutely pivotal. This is like, to a religious person, whether or not God exists. Like, this is the whole theory revolves around this. And that's the attempt at explaining it. It's the embodied consciousness, but it's not in our minds. It's not not in our minds, but it can be, but it's out there. And somehow we're talking about it, even though it's not really in our conscious minds. This is fuzzy, 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 fuzzy. You'd think that this would be where the conversation starts, like, oh, man, let me tell you about this amazing metaphysical thing, the embodied consciousness, and, oh, there's this belief system that's outside of our minds, but it still could affect our minds, and wow, look at all the implications. It's like, no, this kind of comes at the end of the conversation, like, oh, yeah. There's, what if we, if you get the metaphysics of this wrong, the whole theory just falls apart. Now, is that, are those not yet conscious beliefs, are those in every individual's mind and they're not yet conscious of it or is there some kind of a broader uh, like a union like meta conscious <laughs> i'm just trying to think if, you're starting to sound like jung <laughs> yeah, no, I, i'm trying to think of if if it's the case that there are these what you could call beliefs or values that we're not yet aware of. Does that mean that there's some kind of an imprint of them in every individual's mind, then they could become aware of them? Or is it that it's, it's bigger than that? Well, again, complex question. Maybe the only way I can respond to that is to say, these things that are not yet conscious, I actually see philosophy's role as being precisely to actually plummet these things or to try and to access these things. The, the role of critical thought is to take the not yet conscious and as much as possible make it conscious. Mm -hmm. So we might even talk about that as un, you know, unexamined uh, assumptions or whatever, but, but something along those lines. Now, feminism here sits beautifully within the context of philosophy for me because it's doing the same thing. It's doing the work of taking taking that not yet conscious and trying to make it conscious. So in this context, what feminism is doing is taking the not yet conscious of the masculine imaginary and of patriarchy and trying to bring it to consciousness in a way that will benefit men and women alike. This to me sounds like mysticism. Like a central claim is about this not yet conscious thing that drives our behavior and we don't even have free will because it exists. And I ask, well, what is it? Is well, like it's a hard question, and I can try to answer it vaguely this way. But prior to its, prior to its reaching that level of consciousness, where is it? It is embodied. It is embodied in each individual. Well, I guess it's embodied in each individual, insofar as as yes, we are part of larger social and cultural collectives that share these imaginaries or they share this imaginary so would you say then that the kind of the metaphysical analysis of it is that there is some kind of a larger collective mind for maybe that's lack of a better term or unconscious belief system that actually has some kind of existence to it that each individual mind is illuminating or is it that it's in everybody's individual mind that gets i wouldn't call it mind at all okay. i would simply call it Oh, golly, to use a 60s term, ideology. Okay. 
you know yes we share there's there's a shared ideology or better still set of ideologies that interact in complex ways and yes we partake of those ideologies i mean the french uh, philosopher louis althusser had a good way of of making a kind of distinction between the ideological state apparatus and the repressive state apparatus that each culture has its repressive obvious ways of making us toe the line but it has its more subtle ideological ways of helping us toe the line by internalizing the values of that dominant ideology or, or culture it doesn't help to answer the question by calling it a new word now we're calling it an ideology what is an ideology is it inside our minds is it in other people's minds is there some some communal mind out there in which it's embodied and then we just kind of soak it up none of these questions are answered absolutely central and foundational and if there's any mistakes here well the whole thing falls apart and yet to me it really does sound like religious superstitious thinking but i would imagine chronologically it comes about after the fact to try to justify the claims that she was making earlier so we start with the conclusions in mind about the patriarchy and injustice and why there are differences between men and women and then we try to piece together some remarkable narrative about the embodied mind that is an ideology that we can't really talk about what it is or how it exists that takes away our free will until we become aware of it. So that is my interview breakdown for a very fun conversation with Dr. Michelle Bulos walker Hope you guys enjoyed my commentary. If you've got thoughts on the matter, make sure to leave a comment, leave a rating and a review on iTunes. If you're very enthusiastic, head over to patreon.com slash Steve Patterson, and you can be a supporter of the show, and I'll talk to you guys next week.